and thank you everyone for joining us today. I am Mr. Saksana along with my colleagues from Jackson Park Pharmaceuticals Limited, Dr. Deepika Chabra. I am pleased to extend a warm welcome to all of you at today's webinar on heart disease in pregnancy, which is being held under the ages of AOGD in association with MAMC and LNJP Hospital Daily. The Jackson Park Pharma as academic partner makers of Dicorid Maintain and Divatron. Today's discussion are brought to you by Jackson Paul Pharmaceuticals, makers of Lycorid, Maintain, and Divatron. We extend a hearty welcome to prominent uh, all the attendees and experts. We kindly ask attendees to post your questions, explanations, clarifications, suggestions by text in Q&A box. Please note this webinar is streaming live on Facebook and the chat has already been shared on the chat box. Please visit our YouTube channel, Jackson Paul Medical Insights, to access all the webinars in the future. And as we initiate today's sessions, I request Dr. Sunita Malik to kindly start the proceedings. Today's topic is, as you know, is on uh, heart disease in pregnancy. This is an important topic and everybody should know. As we were, you know, it's been there, we were students, we used to get more of rheumatic heart disease and uh, and now we have uh, not only RHT, we have congenital also. We are now getting post surgery also, post uh, balloon velvotomy, uh, uh, and uh, and of course the other surgery with the, on patient with anticoagulants. So many cases we are getting uh, of heart disease and postpartum cardiomyopathy is also. So this is an important topic which is going to be discussed today by the students of. Uh, uh, Bolanazar Medical College and uh, and uh, uh, Loknaik Hospital by Vandana, Dr. Vandana and Dr. Vijeta. And, and the moderators are going to be Dr. Shakun Tyagi, Dr. Harsha. And of course, it's being chaired by Dr. Asmita, who is uh, not only the uh, president of AOGT, and, but also the Today's chairperson, she, as we know, is she director, professor, and head of Ops and Gyni. Welcome, Dr. Asmita uh, of Anazad Medical College. Her area of interest is maternal fetal medicine. So today's topic is her own interest. And I know she must have taken an active part in the preparation of her students. So over to you, Dr. Asmita, to say a few words before we start the session. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sunita, and a warm welcome to all the participants. Uh, as uh, you rightly pointed out, heart disease is common, and because of advancements in treatment and availability of a surgical treatment, many women with heart disease are reaching childbearing age group and having families. So it's not unusual for us to deal with the patients who are coming to us with a heart disease in pregnancy. And so today, Dr. Vandana and Dr. Vijayat are going to present the case of the commonest heart disease, that's the rheumatic heart disease, who has undergone a surgery. And we will through uh, discuss the antenatal, intrapartum, postpartum management. 
and i'm sure dr shakun and dr harsh are going to moderate it really well and grill them and this is going in discussion is going to be interesting for the all the participants so thank you and again a warm welcome to everyone so can i have the biotech of dr shakun and dr harsha just a few words about two of them dr shakun tyagi is professor of obla and gyni in malana dar medical college and she is international figo fellowship of 2000 done fellowship in 2009 in cape town she is gst fast track young scientist fellowship also in 2009 to 12 best journal paper of the year in 2014 jogi and the member of many committees editor of our nachi delhi bulletin and i'm sure got many prizes also and research papers and publications our uh, next moderator is dr harsha gaikwad she is professor at dmc and sabdarang hospital new delhi she is coordinator of who delhi silver registry project and doing it so well and diligently and of course she is a very good hard working doctor and does her work silently but with perfection she is member of silver society of india with many publications in many international and national journals so over to both of you to start today's class thank you sunita ma'am for the kind introduction uh, good evening all uh, i am dr vandana and with me dr vijayata we are from uh, pg residents from molana azad medical college Uh, we are here to present a case under the moderation of uh, Dr. Harsha Ma'am and Dr. Shakunti Agni Ma'am. Uh, my patient, Mrs. X, 30 year old, primary gravida, resident of Nadela, Delhi, uh, who has received a primary education, who make up by occupation. Uh, she was admitted on 2nd of July. Her LMP was on 20th of October 2021, making her EDD of 27th of July with a POG of 38 plus 5 5 days. she mainly present uh, presenting complaints a patient is a known case of uh, rheumatic heart disease which was diagnosed 8 uh, years back with a mitral valve replacement done 6 years back in view of my, uh, severe mitral regurgitation she presented to the anc clinic with 8 and a half months of amenorrhea for the routine antenatal checkup she was admitted to the maternity ward in view of pregnancy with a mechanical valve replacement for switch over to the injectable anticoagulants history of presenting illness patient was uh, admitted from the antenatal clinic for switch over from the oral anticoagulants to the injectable anticoagulants there were no complaints of breathlessness palpitation or thopnea or chest pain there were no complaints of high grade fever sore throat or joint pain no complaints of pain abdomen leaking pv bleeding per vaginum or from any other side patient could hear the valve click as before coming to trimester history the first trimester it was a non consanguineous marriage spontaneously conceived patient didn't take any preconceptional counseling on the preconception folic acid urine pregnancy test was positive 15 days overdue at home she was booked at loknaik hospital at 7 week period of gestation there was no history of excessive nausea or vomiting no history of fever without without rash or any radiation exposure patient took regular uh, regularly for the cardiac medications she was under tab uh, aspirin 75 mg daily tab lasilactone which is tab furosemide and spironolactam which was 1025 tab digoxin 0.125 mg once daily and tab acinocumarol 34 mg alternate days with maintaining of inr 3 to 4 and she was on penicillin uh, g4 like international units bd she was admitted and she was changed to mainly injectable low molecular weight heparin which was 60 mg subcutaneous twice daily between 6 to 12 weeks spread of gestation and tab lasilactone was stopped and tab furosemide 20 mg twice daily was started Urine glucose tolerance test was done on admission and was told normal. Ultrasound was performed to confirm the pregnancy at two months of amenorrhea and it was told normal and responding. There was no history of pain abdomen, discharge per vaginum, no history of breathlessness, palpitations, chest pain or swelling of lower limb, no history of bleeding per vaginum or from any other side. Coming to second trimester history, she had regular ANC follow up. Regular monthly visits was at. Uh, GB Panth Hospital for the cardiac condition, and she uh, consumed regular cardiac medications with the maintaining P, uh, PT INR between two point five to three point five. Quickening was felt at fifth month of amenorrhea, and she perceived normal fetal movement since then. She consumed hematinix and the calcium intakes uh, regularly from fourth month of amenorrhea. Received two doses of tetanus toxoi. Second uh, scan, which is level two, was done at fifth month of amenorrhea and was told normal. Oral glucose tolerance test was repeated again at 28th week and was told normal. There was no history of breathlessness, palpitations, chest pain, swelling of lower limb. 
there was no history of raised BP records, no history of uh, pain abdomen or leaking per vagina, no history of bleeding per vagina or from any other site. Coming to third trimester history, no history of breathlessness, chest pain, palpitations, no history of high BP records, no history of pain abdomen or leaking per vagina, no history of bleeding per vagina or from any other site, and she perceived adequate fetal movements. Dr. Vandana, how frequently did your patient visit antenatal clinic and what all things were asked during each antenatal visit and uh, what all uh, things was she examined for during each antenatal visit? Uh, Ma'am, first, whenever patient uh, comes to our antenatal visit with any of the cardiac history, we have to risk stratify it according to the modified WHO. So our patient, since she belongs uh, to, since her valve was replaced and she belongs to modified WHO class 3, she need to have either bi-monthly or monthly regular visits uh, with the uh, cardiologist, including the uh, obstetrician. So at each visit, uh, we asked her regarding the, one is the rheumatic fever recurrence history, which includes a joint pain. And in sore throat or any fever and we have to rule out infective endocarditis uh, and uh, we have to rule out the heart failure or uh, symptoms which includes mainly breathlessness palpitations any swelling of low limb pedal edema or any uh, chest pain and all that and next uh, we have to ask her to follow up again in uh, uh, a cardiologist wherever she's following since she is following in gp fund we have to ask her uh, to follow up regularly and investigations as it previously echo is supposed to be done one is baseline echocardiography ideally before pregnancy and if it is normal and if patient is asymptomatic throughout there is no need to repeat if she's symptomatic if she gets any exertional breathlessness or palpitations we are supposed to repeat her echocardiography and since she's on uh, low uh, warfarin we have to monitor the prothrombin time and INR every uh, monthly month. Okay, please continue with the rest of the history. Yes, ma'am. Patient got admitted at eight and a half months of amenorrhea from the antenatal clinic with a switch over from oral to the injectable anticoagulants. Tab equosprin was stopped and the other cardiac medications were con continued. Blood and urine investigations were done. Vitals monitoring, including pulse rate, blood pressure, saturation, chest auscultation were done every fourth hourly. And fetal monitoring were done, including daily fetal movement count and fetal heart sound monitoring were done every 12th hour. Coming to menstrual history, uh, she attained menarche at the age of 14 years. Previous menstrual cycles were for four days at 20 to 30 days interval, which was regular, and she had normal flow, no menstrual complaints. Her last menstrual period was on 20th of uh, October. She was sure of dates. Coming to obstetric history, she was married for nine months, which was non-consanguineous marriage. She's a primary gravida, spontaneously conceived. She didn't use any contraceptives. Past medical history, patient was diagnosed as heart disease seven to eight years back at the age of 22 years. She presented at the GP Panth hospital with a history of breathlessness on exertion and lying down for a period of four to five months prior to the presentation. History of uh, rheumatic fever was elicited from the mother. Patient had fever with the joint pains, which was uh, asymmetrical in joint and larger joints were involved in the childhood. ECG and chest x-ray were done along with some other investigations as told by the mother and some cardiac valve defect was told, which will require surgery was explained to the patient. She took medications for one year, following which she got operated on uh, 2nd of November 2016 at the GP Pan Hospital. Valve replacement was done. She got discharged Did after... Uh, uh, do you have a do? You, did you see the papers which valve was given to her? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, mitral valve is replaced and uh, ONX valve was replaced with her. That's a metallic valve. Was she was replaced with metallic valve? So, uh, are there? Do we need to know which exactly which company or which uh, type of metallic valve is uh, given to her, or all the metallic valves are same? Uh, Ma'am, actually the valves are classified according to the thrombogenicity, which includes the uh, low thrombogenic, medium thrombogenic and the high thrombogenic. The low thrombogenic valves are, as examples are Carbomedics, uh, Metronic Hall, ATS, Metronic Open Pivot and the medium thrombogenicity uh, and Onyx, sorry, and the medium thrombogenicity are uh, bi-leaflet valves with, uh, uh, and the high thrombogenic are the uh, Lily Casters and Homnisens. Our patient was on ONX, uh, which is the low thrombogenicity and we categorize the patient based on their risk factors, which is into low risk none and uh, if one are present, the risk factors are either the valve replacement, previous thromboembolism, atrial fibrillations, mitral stenosis of uh, any degree and left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35%. Our patient, since she got replaced with the mitral valve, so she has one risk factor. So uh, her INR was maintained 
target was supposed to be three and I did supposed to be about 3.5. So uh, uh, the target INR depends on the risk factors and with, out of which the valve the patient has also has a very important role. So yes. all the valves are not shown. We, we should see the patient's papers. And uh, currently, most of the valves, if they're recently installed, then they, they are usually low thrombogenicity ones. Okay, but we should know exactly which valve she's. Okay, you can go back to previous okay, presentation. Yeah, since you know that she was operated before being pregnant, what preconceptional counseling should have been done? Which uh, was not done in this patient. Uh, Ma'am, ideally, uh, preconceptional WHO, since she belongs to WHO category uh, 3, so we have to preconceptionally counsel, we have to explain her regarding the stratification according to modified WHO and the other scoring systems also, which includes Cartrick, Zohara and Ropak. So ideally, we follow modified WHO scoring system. Preconceptionally, we have to see what medication she is on. Since she presented to us with seven weeks of uh, gestation, so, uh, so ideally, with between six to 12 weeks, we're supposed to change if she is on any oral anticoagulants, example, warfarin, majority will be on oral anticoagulants. So, so we have to... This is the management you are speaking about. What will you tell the patient? How will you counsel the patient? Uh, one is we have to uh, tell regarding the process. We have to tell her regarding the uh, number of frequency of visits, including both the obstetrician and the, uh, which includes a multidisciplinary approach, which is obstetrician, the cardiologist, and uh, the anesthetist. And we have to tell her how frequently she's supposed to visit based on her uh, modified W2 scoring system. And uh, we have to explain her the cardiovascular events, which occurs during the pregnancy, the course of hospital stay, and including the uh, labor uh, management also, ma'am. The first stage, the second stage, and the contraceptive advices, everything has to be explained preconceptionally. And ideally, she's supposed to take the counsel about the uh, pregnancy outcome with relation to the wall replacement. Does it uh, have an impact on the pregnancy outcome? What will you tell her? Um, Ma'am, uh, um, ideally, the outcome, we categorize everything based on modified WHO. So we categorize uh, in, in modified WHO class uh, one, there is 2.5 to 5 percent risk of cardiovascular events which are the complications which can include uh, the congestive heart failures, atrial fibrillation, thromboembolism, or sometimes they can be cardiac arrest also. In uh, WHO uh, class two, there's ideally 5.5 to 10%. In WHO two to three, there will be uh, up to 20%. Which category does your patient fall into? Ma'am, WHO category three, which has up to 30% uh, risk of cardiovascular events in the pregnancy. Okay. And, uh, would you like to explain the risk to the baby also, to the fetus? Uh, the yes, there are both obstetrical and the neonatal uh, uh, neonatal risk also. Obstetrical, mainly she can go into preterm labor. Uh, she can have preeclampsia, gestation, hypertension. She can have postpartum hemorrhage. These are the known risk complications and the obstetrical complications. In uh, uh, neonate, there are chances of prematurity because major, many will uh, deliver preterm. So the prematurity... Uh, nursery admissions and uh, uh, since our patient is rheumatic heart disease though chances of baby getting affected is much less because she comes under modified w 3 but there are more of the maternal complications when compared to the obstetric complications and fetal risk if she goes into labor on oral anticoagulants um, so there are risk due to oral anticoagulants during first trimester and risk due to the baby mother oral intake of um, anticoagulants yes, by the mother near delivery. You know? So you have to categorize both. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, risk categorization, mainly if she's on warfarin, it depends on the period of gestation. If she's taking in the first trimester, ideally between 6 to 12 weeks, there's a very high risk of warfarin embryopathy. And that will be divided based on the dose of the oral anticoagulants. If she's taking uh, less than 5 milligram of warfarin, there is around 0.9%, uh, 0.45 uh, to 0.9% of the fetal loss. If she's taking um, embryopathy, if she's taking high dose more than uh, 5 milligram, there's up to 20% uh, risk, ma'am, 10 to 20%. And after that, in second trimester, irrespective of the dose, there is still 2% risk of the uh, fetal abnormalities, which can include the CNS abnormalities, uh, the fetal embryopathy, that is warfarin embryopathy called as contradict syndrome, where the patient will have the nasal hy uh, cartilage hypoplasia, as laryngeal hypoplasia. Uh, and during no, early... Yes, ma'am. Uh, stippled epiphysis. 
and if the patient goes in labor or uh, with the oral anticoagulants so ideally she has to be taken to the cesarean section if she delivers uh, if she is on oral anticoagulants there are high chances of baby having intracranial hemorrhage as well please continue patient got operated on 2nd of uh, november 2016 at the gp pan hospital valve replacement was done she was discharged after 2 weeks on oral anticoagulants which was acinocumarol 3 mg oral diuretics ecosprin and antibiotics she had regular follow up at gp pan monthly with a uh, dose of acinocumarol titrated according to her uh, prothrombin time uh, prothrombin time on the ina valves there was no history of exacerbation of symptoms no history of uh, icu admission coming to family history there is no history of diabetes mellitus hypertension tuberculosis or any other chronic medical uh, or surgical illness among the family members personal history she had adequate sleep she had normal bowel and bladder habits there were no addictions or any mood disorders no history of uh, domestic violence dietary history she is non vegetarian by diet and she consumes about 2600 kilocalories per day and 78 grams of proteins per day which was adequate for her uh, height and weight Socio economic history: She belongs to low middle class of the uh, status of modified Kupu Swami scale according to the 2021 score. So, uh, my uh, according to the history, my patient X, 30 year old, primary gravida with 38 plus 5 weeks period of gestation, with a known case of rheumatic heart disease, with a history of mitral valve replacement done, with NYHA class one, without infective endocarditis. Shall we proceed to the general physical examination, ma'am? Ah, uh, pl uh, please continue with the examination. On general physical examination, patient is sitting comfortably, conscious and well oriented to time, place, and person. She is moderately built and well nourished. Her height is one fifty four centimeter and weight is pre pregnancy weight is sixty kg, making her BMI twenty five point three. Her gait is normal. On a vital examination. Pulse rate is eighty-eight beats per minute. Regular, good volume, no radio radial or radio femoral delay. All peripheral pulses are palpable. Her BP is one twenty-four by eighty mm hg taken in right arm in sitting position. Respiratory rate is eighteen breath per minute. Thora, which is thoraco abdominal. Her SpO two is ninety-eight percent on room air. Temperature is ninety-eight point seven degrees. She, no pallor, no excess. Adequate hydration is adequate. Oro dental, oro dental hygiene well maintained. No central cyanosis. No thyroid enlargement. No JVP raised. No lymphadenopathy. Bilateral breast show normal changes of pregnancy. No erythema marginatum, subcutaneous nodule, which is suggest, which suggests sign of acute rheumatic activity. No ossular nodule, Janeway lesion. And splinter hemorrhage, which suggests sign and sign of infective endocarditis. No pedal edema. And calf tenderness. On inspection, as shown in the figure, midline vertical scar is present on the sternum, which extends from the sternal angle to the ZT sternum. Apex impulse not seen. No visible vein or pulsation. No deformity seen. On palpation, palpation, apex bead is present at fourth intercostal space, one centimeter lateral to the mid clavicular line, which is normal and regular. No thrill appreciated. No parasternal heat. On auscultation, heart rate is eighty-eight beats per minute, regular. On auscultation in mid mitral, tricuspid, aortic, and pulmonary area, S one, S two heard, and metallic click heard over mitral area. No carotid or epigastrium bruise was present. Or coming to the respiratory examination, bilateral air enter equal, normal vesicular breath sound heard over all lung fields. No added sound and vessel crests. Neurological examination, no abnormalities. Detected on per abdominal examination after taking the consent of the patient after emptying the bladder. So, uh, you, would you yes. like to show the examination? Yes, ma'am. Or would you like to read it? Yes, ma'am. We will show it, ma'am. After taking the uh, after taking the consent and uh, emptying the bladder, we will ask the patient to uh, lie supine. And uh, with proper exposure, will uh, do the examination. Examination will start from inspection. On inspection, abdomen is uniformly distended. Umbilicus is central and inverted. Linea nigra, you can see it, and stria gravidarum present, and hernial sites are three. 
Coming to the palpation part, inspectory findings were confirmed on palpation. After correcting the dextro rotation, we'll do the fundal height. The first resistance what will, will be the. It will just uh, just pause it. Uh, would you like to do all this examination in supine position, as you say, dorsal position, or would you like to uh, make any change in your statement? Ma'am, will uh, flex the knees while doing the examination. Only, only, uh, but the flexion and abduction at hip joint. Flexion and, and abduction at knee joint. joint. Yes, ma'am. Slight abduction also. Yes, and flexion at hip joint and knee joint. Yes, so this examination is not supposed to be done in dorsal position. Please continue. Uh, we'll measure the fundal height. The fundal height of my patient correspond to 32 weeks with flank pull. After uh, taking the fundal height, we'll do the symphyso fundal height, which is doing by doing the uh, by uh, measuring tape. We'll uh, from the uh, first resistance we felt, we'll mark that point and up to pubic symphysis, we'll measure fundal height. And during measurement of the fundal height, we'll make the uh, leg extended. Uh, the fundal the fundal height of my patient correspond to 30 uh, to we, 32 35 centimeter and after fundal height we'll do the grips while doing the fundal grip the broad st broad structure suggestive of breach while doing the left lateral grip uh, smooth curved structure suggestive of spine of the baby while doing the right uh, grip la right lateral grip uh, irregular knobby structure suggestive of limbs of the baby while doing the so, uh, first pelvic grip where i first pelvic grip hard palatable structure suggestive of head of the baby while doing the second pelvic grip my hands are not converged my hands are not converging that means the head is engaged after doing the uh, palpate after doing the grips we'll do the auscultation part in which we'll uh, will spino umbilical line left spino umbilical line will measure the fund uh, fetal heart rate which is 144 beats per minute regular on per would you like to comment on liker estimated fetal fetal uh, weight by five it was palpable Yes, ma'am. And like and, uh, uterus is relaxed. Estimated fetal watt, uh, weight is approximately 2.6 kg. Liker appear clinically adequate. And uh, the head is four fifth palpable. Yeah. So you should not need the slide for this. Huh? <laughs> okay. Please, uh, please continue. Uh, ma'am, per speculum examination, cervical os is closed, cervix is healthy, no discharge. On we will do the pelvic assessment at the time of labor. Why you Why? don't want to patient is already 38 weeks? You don't want to do it now. Can you yeah. do it? What are the pros and cons of doing it now as compared to doing it in labor? Why you are uh, not doing it now and you are leaving, leaving it to labor? It can be done either way, but you should know what are the pros and cons. So uh, what are the benefits of doing it now and what are the cons? What are, what are um, why you don't want to do now and you want to do it later? As my patient is uh, uh, has undergone a mechanical wall replacement, so she uh, she lies under the high risk for infective endo going into infective endocarditis. So the, by doing the uh, per vaginal examination, there is increased risk of infection or infective endocarditis. So I would like to prefer at the time of labor. So uh, do you think the this pelvis is adequate? Uh, pelvis is ad adequate in this case. Is there any um, findings suggestive that? Uh, about adequacy of pelvis at this time, any any sign which you've already we, mentioned? Uh, we have done uh, the pelvic assessment by uh, modified Moonwalker's method, which uh, and the baby head is a uh, four fifth palpable. That is, it's going into the pelvis, and uh, so uh, and the weight of the baby is average. That is two point six kg. So it is favorable toward the vaginal delivery. Okay, so you want to avoid any unnecessary PBs, yes, ma and necessary and in chance of infection in this patient. So you would like to do the first per, per vaginal examination when she goes into labor. So that's also a right strategy. Strategy. And how okay. did you please continue? Infective endocarditis on clinical examination. You said without infective endocarditis. How did you rule out? So, uh, so what is what in history and examination 
suggests that there is no infective hepatitis in this patient. Ma'am, on the basis of history, there no history of any fever with uh, high grade fever, uh, and on examination, there is no ocular nodule, chainway lesion, or splinter hemorrhage or clubbing. So uh, these are the signs. So on abdominal examination, was there any findings which is missing, which can be present in subacute uh, bacterial endocarditis? Um, there can be splenomegaly, splenomegaly, which you did not mention, and uh, that also be if like it's difficult to palpate spleen near term, but at least you should mention that you tried and you were not able to uh, palpate it because of the gravid uterus. That that shows that you know that a splenomegaly in a case of heart disease could be a feature of so infective endocarditis. Especially Sabe. Um, on the basis of history and examination, my clinical impression is my patient X, 30 year old primary gravida, 38 uh, plus 5 week of gestation, with known case of rheumatic heart disease, with history of mitral valve replacement, with singleton pregnancy, in longitudinal lie, with cephalic presentation, NYHA class 1, without infective endocarditis, not in labor. And one more thing you have to add whether she is in failure or not, not in failure. Yes, ma'am. We yes, have missed out on that. So what would have been her NYH classification had she been in failure? Ma'am, since uh, her NYH is one, uh, so she is not in failure. While if the patient NYH is four, then that means she is in failure. Okay, please carry on, please carry on. So uh, this is your final diagnosis. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Harsha, would you like to uh, continue with the revivals? Would you like to further ask them now, the questions? Yes. So now your clinical impression is this. Now, how will you proceed for the management of this patient? Uh, Ma'am, we have to do the routine investigations and the specific investigations, which is according to the case. And next was to prognosticate and counsel the, both the patient and the attender. We have to plan and then monitoring and finally treat the patient. Coming to investigations, which is basically on admission, routine antenatal investigations, including blood grouping with RH typing, hemogram with the RBC indices, uh, HIV, HBSAG, and VDRL. Your urine routine and urine culture sensitivity has to be sent. Oral glucose tolerance test to the DIPSI. Thyroid function, function test may be done. Uh, ultrasound uh, and dual markers. Specific investigations includes the serum electrolytes, uh, prothrombin time, and the INR. If the patient is on warfarin, APTT if the patient is on unfractionated heparin, and the factor 10 on low molecular weight, baseline ECG and echocardiography has to be done. Then we have to plan accordingly. We have to admit the patient in HDU. We have to risk stratify according to the modified WHO scoring. And it is a multidisciplinary approach we have to go through. Uh, and uh, pregnancy heart team involvement. We have to explain the risk obstetric as well as the offspring complication. We have to plan for regarding the shifting of the patient to short acting anticoagulant and timing and mode of the delivery, labor and postpartum management and the contraception advice. Now, risk stratification according to modified WHO scoring system. According to modified WHO, there is uh, uh, one, uh, two, 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 three, three, and uh, four. Uh, ma'am, do I have to explain now all the four? Shall I explain, ma'am? Yes, you can. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so mainly in WHO uh, 1, there is 2.5 to 5% risk of the cardiovascular events. It mainly includes pulmonary stenosis, which can be mild or the uh, small. Patent duct is uh, arteriosis, small or milder. Mitral valve prolapse, which is small and mild. Successfully repaired shunt defects, which is uh, AST, VST, PDA, and APVR. Uh, patient has to follow up once or twice in local hospital. Delivery can be done in the local hospital. Uh, there is no need for multidisciplinary approach for WHO 1. In WHO2, uh, which has 5 to 7.5% uh, risk of cardiovascular events, they mainly include unrepaired ASD or ventricular septal defects, repaired tetralogy of phallus, uh, Turner syndrome without any aortic coactation. Uh, they have to follow every tri each trimester at the local hospital and uh, uh, delivery can be conducted at the uh, local hospital. In WHO... 
sorry ma'am. WHO 2 and 3, which has 10 to 19% risk of cardiovascular events, they mainly have this mild left ventricular impairment with the ejection fraction of more than 54%, native other tissue valve disease, which is not considered WHO 1 and 4, marfins or any uh, syndromes without any iotic dilatation, iota less than 45 millimeters dilated in the bicuspid iotic valve, repaired coactitions, atrioventricular septal defect. They have to follow bimonthly in on expert centers and delivery has to be conducted in the expert center. Coming to WHO uh, 3, which has 19 to 27% of uh, the cardiovascular events, it mainly includes left ventricular impairment, 30 to 45% is the ejection fraction, mechanical valve, uh, systemic right ventricular, uh, right ventricle with a good or mildly impaired function, fountain circulation, unrepaired cyanotic heart diseases, moderate MS, uh, severe asymptomatic AS, moderate iotic dilatation. These patients have to follow up bi-monthly in expert center and delivery has to be conducted in expert center. WHO plus 4, ideally pregnancy is uh, not to be recommended. Pregnancy is contraindicated. So in this, they have 40 to 100% risk of the cardiovascular events. They mainly include pulmonary arterial hypertension, which can be of any cause, severe systemic ventricular dysfunction, where the ejection fraction is less than 30%, moderate systemic right ventricular dysfunction, severe mitral stenosis, severe symptomatic iotic stenosis, iotic dilatation, vascular ailer downloads, severe recoactation. Uh, here, uh, uh, bicuspid iotic with the root dilatations of more than 50 mm. They have to follow up monthly in an expert center and delivery has to be conducted over there. Uh, we have to take multidisciplinary approach in managing the patient with heart disease who are more the modified WHO more than two score. In that, we have to involve obstetrician, cardiologist, and anesthesia. This is the minimum requirement of a multidisciplinary team. In uh, additional experts like genetist, fetal medicine specialist, and pediatric cardiologist will be involved if the patient has a congenital heart disease and the chances of um, baby having a congenital heart disease are more. We have to involve cardiothoracic surgeon in case of patient need valve replacement or balloon valvoplasty. Neonatologist, we have to involve. During monitoring and treatment, we have to do maternal monitoring and fetal monitoring. In maternal monitoring, we will start with vital monitoring, which include pulse rate, BP, saturation, respiratory. We have to monitor every four hourly, and JVP and intermittent chest auscultation will be done four to six hours. In fetal monitoring, we have to do biophysical profile weekly and NST non-stress stress bi-weekly. On treatment, we have to ask patient to lie in propped up position. We have to keep oxygen bedside, Da daily fetal movement count and right, uh, right rest in left lateral position will be done. Cardiology opinion will be taken and switch over from oral anticoagulant to injection low molecular weight heparin will be done for our patient. And we have to ask patient to continue the cardiac medication as advised. The oral iron, folic acid and calcium will be continued. Coming to shifting to the short-acting anticoagulant, which is unfractionated heparin. Uh, ideally, uh, until uh, 12 weeks gestation to 36, we uh, continue warfarin, which is oral anticoagulant. At 36 weeks onwards, we have to restart either unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Uh, 36 hours before the planned delivery, uh, it has to be replaced to unfractionated heparin, uh, maintaining an APTT, uh, twice the uh, control. Uh, we have to stop unfractionated. Uh, Dr. Bandana, why do we shift from low molecular weight to unfractionated heparin. Uh, Ma'am, low molecular weight heparin has a, a longer half-life, T half is uh, 12 hours and the duration usually lasts for up to 24 hours. Uh, whereas uh, unfractionated heparin, ideally it has a TF of 6 hours. So whenever a patient can... Land any other reason? Any, any additional reason? Uh, and unfractionated heparin, uh, there is antagonist of unfractionated heparin, which is protamine sulfate and low molecular weight heparin doesn't have. And ideally, we won't get to know when the patient lands up in labor. So when the patient goes in labor, ideally, we have to stop six hours before. So it is better to uh, continue unfractionated when compared to low molecular weight heparin. So uh, if a patient is on low, low molecular weight heparin, suppose uh, 10 o'clock, she has received her uh, full dose of uh, low molecular weight heparin. And at 12 o'clock, uh, she requires urgent cesarean for certain, any reason. So, uh, wh how will you proceed in that case? Uh, because you said there is no antagonist. 
uh, ma'am ideally if the patient is on uh, low molecular weight heparin they will have high risk of uh, uh, bleeding and the uh, other risk so of what do we do to present prevent those complications how do we proceed to prevent those complications can we do anything yes ma'am so it is better to switch over ideally it is better to switch over to yes. unfractured heparin suppose, suppose we have not switched over and patient has gone uh, we patient has uh, sudden deceleration spontaneous decelerations because of any reason so can we proceed for cesarean by doing something some intervention ma'am they tell that we can give protamin sulfate though it doesn't and we we will do we'll do we'll give uh, fresh frozen plasma fresh frozen plasma we'll give her ffp and then we can proceed and suppose she is on uh, your uh, acetrom and yes, she goes into labor and then yes. the same situation arises she needs yes, to see cesarean then what will you Mom, uh, ideally, if she is on warfarin and she goes in labor, we have your to voice is ideally. not clear. Uh, Mom, if the patient is on oral anticoagulants and if she goes in labor, so we have if she needs cesarean section emergency, we can transfuse fresh frozen plasma or cryo precipitate, and we can bring down the INR to at least one point five, and we can take up before incision or before giving spinal anesthesia. If the INR is one point five, we can continue and proceed with it. And ideally, if she is on warfarin, we have to take up her cesarean section because there will be high chances of intracranial hemorrhages when if we allow her with the vaginal delivery. And we have to so, give vitamin K injectable also, ten milligram IM. And IM or IV? <laughs> Ma'am, I. You will give IM injection or IV injection? Vitamin K IV or IM? Ma'am, we give IM. <laughs> Never. You should have IV preparation. Otherwise, you'll land up in an hematoma. and uh, what uh, so what should be the uh, duration between stopping uh, by the oral anticoagulant and uh, vaginal delivery ideally ma'am ideally if she is on oral anticoagulant minimum of 2 weeks is supposed to tell according to the uh, european yes. guidelines tell that at least 2 yes. weeks is supposed to stop before the vaginal delivery Yes, so it's not that if we are okay yesterday or seventy two hours back, patient has already stopped. Now it's safe for the baby to go through the vaginal delivery. But it's not only the mother; if the, even if the mother's INR is fine, the drug might not be metabolized in the baby. The my baby might not be having enough anticoagulant, enough enough coagulation factors to uh, withstand labor, and baby can have intracranial hemorrhages. Okay. Okay. What about the anesthesia part? Which anesthesia will be preferred? Ma'am, epidural anesthesia is ideally preferred, and uh, since our patient has rheumatic heart disease with the uh, uh, ejection maintained uh, valve function, so we can give epidural uh, anesthesia can be given. Uh, but if the patient has any other patients, like if there's any uh, uh, aortic stenosis and uh, uh, coagulations of aorta, I really tell that you're not supposed to give uh, anesthesia. It is better to give narcotic drugs because anesthesia drugs they uh, Causes hypotension and there will be more gra pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the systemic uh, uh, pressure, and there will be uh, more uh, worsening of the condition. Okay. So, uh, what sorry. will happen? What will happen to the mother? Ma'am, she can collapse and patient will go into shock and collapse because of increased peripheral vascular resistance disease. and decreased cardiac output will be uh, ready. Okay. okay, so this is not the situation in your patient. You have given epidural anesthesia. You have the uh, and the uh, catheter is inside. So what yes. instruction will you or the what, what when will you remove the epidural catheter? Uh, when will you start the next dose of LMWH? Uh, Ma'am, if it uh, ideally they tell based on the uh, uh, high risk of the patient. If the patient is moderate to high risk, they tell that you can start with prophylactic dose six hour, six hours uh, removal of the epidural. But generally, we can start twelve hours after the removal of epidural in uh, generally in patients. Only if there is a high risk of the patient having thrombosis, we can give a prophylactic dose based on the uh, weight of the patient, which is unfractionated heparin. We can give based on weight. Uh, which is uh, 20 mg if the patient is less than 50 and uh, 40 mg if the patient is between 50 to 90 kg they tell them okay, like okay. we can we can start uh, low molecular weight after uh, 12 hours sorry I, i couldn't hear you you please uh, be closer to the your, your mic um ma'am if the if you uh, we can restart unfractionated heparin which is 4 to 6 hours uh, after removal of the catheter or you can start low molecular weight heparin 12 hours after 
if your patient is very high risk and if you uh, want to start uh, the therapy uh, prophylactic dose can be given which is uh, unfractionate low molecular weight heparin can be given 20 mg if the weight is less than 50 kg and uh, uh, 40 mg of the weight is between uh, what is the dose what is the dose per kg uh, mm -hmm. ma'am ideally you're supposed to give 1 mg per kg body weight uh, twice daily yeah, that is the therapy. Uh, uh, Dr. Therapy. Uh, Dr. Dr. Therapy. Dr. Vanda, when you are answering, uh, I would request you not to answer in terms of second person. You should say, I will do this, not tell ma'am that you will do this or you can Sorry. do this. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the usual practice. We have to keep it. Okay. Yeah, you, sure. you can't do that in exams. It's okay here. Now, uh, when will you start uh, the, uh, when will you start an original medication after LMWH? So there are two things to be kept in mind. First is the gap which you have to keep between removal of the catheter and uh, giving the next dose of low molecular weight. Second thing is the gap between delivery and your starting anticoagulation, injectable and oral. So you just told the gap between the, the removal of the catheter and starting the, uh, the anticoagulant injectable can. Now, would you like to elaborate? Like if not, you've not given her any analgesia, labor analgesia, there's no epidural in situ, then how will you decide the gap between your uh, delivery and your giving oral or injectable anti anticoagulation. How will you start your anticoagulation post delivery? Uh, Ma'am, we'll divide. We have. We have. We will divide the patient into two category. If the patient comes under high risk category, what is we are talking about? Your patient. Talk about your patient. What is the category of your patient? Ma'am, what will you do in your patient? Ma'am, since my patient is has undergone a mitral valve replacement, which is mechanical valve, will do will give the prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin, that is 0.5 milligram per kg body weight, uh, to uh, to the patients after six hours of vaginal delivery, and will start the full therapeutic dose after 12 hours of vaginal delivery. Okay, and uh, 12 hourly. One yes, mg per kg after 12 hours, we will start one milligram and, per kg. And per and. Per uh -huh. And how long will you continue this injectable heparin? Uh, Ma'am, uh, we'll uh, overlap with the warfarin. Uh, low molecular weight heparin and warfarin will be continued till the we uh, achieve the INR. So when will you start oral? Why do you want me to ask so many questions? Now, initially only I asked you, how will you go about the oral and injectable? So you should tell yourself for how many days you should will give injectable and then when will you start giving her oral overlap? After no, how many days of giving injectable? Immediately after delivery, you start overlap, or do you, we uh, do we are we do we try and be safe and we give, we give after some time? We'll start in our institution. We'll start after seventy two hours. We'll start the warfarin, and we'll uh, overlap till the uh, INR reaches the in the. Reaches. So uh, once you start, uh, you should not allow your examiners to give so much. I mean, you should not uh, make your examiners ask so many questions. You should tell yourself, no, okay, for how, then you should also answer for how after how much time of oral anticoagulant you will do the PT. After 72 hours of warfarin, we'll uh, do the PT and PT INR report. If it is not in the therapeutic range, then we'll uh, increase the dose of the warfarin and then repeat, it, repeat the PT INR value after 72 hours. So what should be your target? Ma'am, in our, in our patient, the target is uh, up to three is the target INR value. As she is up to three or more than three? More than three, ma'am. Three to four. So it will be three to four rather, no? So how frequently you will monitor? Uh, Ma'am, we'll monitor every uh, 72 hourly, we'll do the PTINR monitoring. As the half-life of warfarin is 72 hours, so we'll do the INR uh, 72 hours after the dose. And we'll even if you have reached, even if you have reached the required uh, PT, you will do it every 72 hours? After we have reached the uh, PTINR in the therapeutic range, then we'll do twice weekly or monthly according to the
ट्वाइस मंथ और मंथली लेटर ऑन ओके प्लीज कैरी ऑन विद प्रेजेंटेशन Uh, coming to the uh, timing of delivery ma uh, ideally uh, we have to uh, in our in heart patient it is better to allow the patient to go into spontaneous labor so if the for any other obstetrical indications if the patient doesn't go into spontaneous labor the timing of induction will be between 39 to 40 weeks period of gestation and the induction mainly depends upon the cardiac status of the patient the obstetric evaluation including the cervical assessment and the fetal well being and the fetal lung maturity the mode of the delivery as our patient uh, is in our patient the pelvis is adequate and the baby is of average size and she belong to nyha class 1 so the vaginal delivery is preferable so uh, what would be the indications for cesarean in a patient ma'am uh, the patient goes on uh, in the labor with the oral anticoagulant you are not audible dr vanna you are not audible no, dr vanna patient goes in labor on uh, vitamin k antagonist or if it is less than 2 weeks after discontinuation if she has any aggressive aortic pathology like aortic uh, stenosis if she has any acute intractable heart failure and severe pulmonary arterial hypertension so these patients ideally have to be taken for cesarean section so uh, basically it is it has to be the decision for delivery has to be mode of delivery has to be taken by the multidisciplinary team you know and we talk to the anesthetist anesthetist the um, cardiologist and uh, and the gynecologist they sit together and they decide the mode of delivery okay so uh, would you like to uh, what were the next slide go to on to the next question management yeah. so in your patient uh, she is gone into labor hmm she is gone into spontaneous labor so uh, just elaborate uh, how you going to manage this patient during labor Ma'am, during first stage of labor, uh, we'll tell the patient to prop up. Oxygen will be uh, by will be given by mask if required. We'll ask the patient to lie in lap lateral position. We'll maintain the optimum hydration by allowing clear fluid to the patient, and we'll do the frequent monitoring of the vitals, which include. pulse rate bp saturation respiratory rate every 15 to 30 minutes interval and we'll do the intermittent chest auscultation every 15 to 30 minutes interval we'll restrict the pv examination and if we are doing pv examination we have to maintain proper sepsis we will maintain a photogram if the patient goes into active labor we'll do the input output charting every 4 hourly and fetal uh, fhs monitor electronic fetal heart rate monitoring continuous or intermittent will do the antibiotic prophylaxis and labor will give the labor analgesia to the patient which is described below labor analgesia it will uh, it is a multidisciplinary approach involving the uh, anesthesia uh, department the in vaginal delivery we can give epidural analgesia or injection morphine 6 gram 6 mg im with the naloxone to be kept handy so when you are giving morphine at what centimeters at what cervical dilation would you by dilatation would you like to give how will you decide when to give morphine to the patient ma'am during heart disease and labor ha huh? uh during active labor we can give morphine if the patient a uh, cervical dil uh, head uh, cervical dilation is 4 cm we can give morphine because uh, during contraction there is a chances of porto transfusion and maximum chances of going into congestive heart failure so we can uh, give injectable morphine at that time and if more uh, another option to morphine is injection of gamadol how will, how will you get to the patient is 4 cm do you uh, you try and avoid too frequent per vaginal examination so any other parameter you can use ma'am per abdominal examination uh, we can uh, get an idea whether the head uh, by denominator uh, numerator and denominator will divide into four parts the head is divided into four parts five and parts and you can also assess yeah and you can assess the contractions contraction Contract. the duration frequency and intensity of contractions if they are going into their patient is going into active phase then uh, according to contractions at that time you can give her adequate analgesia if the epidural is not available for a patient yes ma'am those patient uh, who have left ventricular outflow tract obstruction or synoptic heart disease in with in that patient will avoid hypotension so we can give narcotic analgesia with as compared to epidural analgesia in that patient 
and epidural NSD after epidural anesthesia the gap is 24 hours after the last dose to deliver. Uh, coming to the antibiotic prophylaxis now. So we give antibiotic prophylaxis mainly to prevent in infective endocarditis, uh, uh, prevent infective endocarditis. So the indications are uh, with the uh, prostatic valve with a history of any prior infective endocarditis, uh, cyanotic heart disease, which includes either unrepaired cyanotic heart diseases or recently repaired within six months of duration or repaired congenital heart diseases uh, with any residual defects either in the valve or surrounding valve and heart transplant individuals with valvulopathy. So what antibiotics do you give for these patients? Uh, what are the current are, recommendations regarding antibiotics? There are uh, injectable and uh, oral anticoagulants. So it is better to give injectable no, anti antibiotics. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry. Antibiotics. Uh, so the intravenous antibiotics mainly uh, we, give, we give to our patient is which we follow in our uh, uh, setup is injection cefrioxone, uh, 1 gram IV, uh, 12 daily we give. Uh, or we can give ampicillin 2 gram uh, IV stat followed by uh, 500 uh, milligram 6 daily. Or we can give cefazolin. If the patient is allergic to the penicillin group of drugs, we can give clindamycin 600 milligram. We can also give oral anti uh, oral uh, antibiotics, which is uh, amoxicillin 2 gram. Or we can give uh, clindamycin 600 or azithromycin uh, 500 milligram. So what in mm -hmm. clinical okay. practice you are giving? Which antibiotic do you give? Mom, we give injection ceftrioxone 1 gram uh, 12 tarly, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about uh, further postpartum management? Second Ma stage and uh, second, stage, second stage, third stage and postpartum management. Uh, Ma'am, during second stage, we'll continue the monitoring, pulse rate, blood pressure, saturation, and respiratory rate. We'll give labor analgesia. We'll cut short the second stage of labor if it is prolonged by using uh, forceps, preferably, because uh, this, uh, uh, in third stage of labor, we'll do the active management of third stage of labor by giving oxytocin 10 milligram IM after the delivery of the baby, control contraction, intermittent um, uterine tone assessment, and uh, uh, delayed cord clamping if the baby is stable. Then we will we'll give diuretic fluorosamide 20 to 40 milligram IV after checking the BP. We'll give morphine 3 milligram IV. We'll initiate the breastfeeding. Early. Why do you give uh, fluorosamide postpartum? What is the rationale behind it? Uh, Ma'am, during the postpartum period, uh, the as the uterus gravid uterus will compress the uh, uh, IVC uh, during postpartum uh, the IVC, uh, IVC will not be compressed by the uterus so there is increase in the preload to the heart so we'll give fluorosamide 20 to 40 milligram IV. You and want to reassess your answer? Why do we give fluorosamide? Is it because of the gravid uterus not compressing or is it something else which happens there are two reasons. during so third stage? One is because of auto transfusion. Uh, once the, there will be uh, uh, 500 to 600 ml of blood will be rushed immediately into the uh, systemic circulation because of uh, the uh, after the delivery. And second is that uh, there will be release of the gravid uterus, and because of the uh, venicable compression will be released, there will be the the blood which usually will be compressed in the lower ut the which will be store uh, in the capacitance vessel. Mm -hmm. Venicable yes, blood and Transfused. Yeah, yeah. And you should avoid any IV, like uh, IV uh, intravenous fluids. Yes, Excessive intravenous fluids must be avoided, especially in OC0 section. We have to give very controlled fluids in these patients. Uh, yes, okay. Um, please elaborate further management. During postpartum period, we have to frequently monitor in initial two hours, we have to frequently monitor in the vitals, which include pulse rate, BP saturation and respiratory rate. We have to do intermittent chest auscultation every 10 minutes interval. We have to check the uterine tone. We have to watch for bleeding per vaginum, perineal examination and input output shortly. Uh, between two to six hours after uh, delivery, the uh, frequency of the monitoring is increased up to 30 minutes. And after six hours, we have to monitor the vitals and uterus tone and bleeding PV uh, four to six hours. So why do you want to be so vigilant even in the postpartum period? So what are the critical periods in during pregnancy, labor and postpartum period? Then why, why are you so vigilant at this time also? What is the fear? Mom, there are chances that patient can go in, if, even if the so first, uh, 
first answer what ma'am asked now what are the various critical periods periods so one is uh, the first trimester between 12 to 16 weeks of gestation where the period a patient can go into failure uh, yeah. and next is a uh, between uh, 20 to 32 weeks of gestation and third is when the patient is goes in labor both in the first and second stage and immediate postpartum period and uh, following 3 to 5 days after delivery uh, so these are the main uh, per uh, periods where the uh, my, there are chance maximum chances of uh, patient going into uh, failure ma'am so now answer the second part as part of the question again why are so you you so vigilant why she at high chances of going into failure now ma'am uh, though the patient can have uh, uh, the normal without no complications she can uh, have uh, uh, such matlab ma'am during the postpartum period as described uh, there is auto transmission of 500 ml blood during which each contraction and release of the ivc pressure compression so there is an increase in the preload which uh, that is why the patient has a increased chances of heart failure during so immediate postpartum period when changes in the cardiac output yes ma'am right? so yes ma'am already disease heart may not be able to tolerate it mm -hmm. and that's why you have to give furosemide right uh, and this process uh, and this process is not only immediate postpartum okay this continues later on also and it might be there till six there is redistribution of the fluid from the periphery to the main circulation from the per so that uh, can happen till almost 5 to 6 days post delivery also so these patients can go into failure later on also postpartum so first 5 to 6 days postpartum is very critical as ma'am said so what is this uh, uh, do you give to this patient who has delivered what in your day to day practice you will examine what instructions will you give to prevent all these complications ma'am we Uh, as there are chances of uh, uh, thromboembolism in this patient, we have to tell the patient to ambulate uh, and adequate take adequate hydration. Initiate early breastfeeding. Then we have to restart her cardiac medications, which was taking uh, which she was taking before. Uh, in our patient, she was taking digoxin and uh, furosemide. So we have to restart the cardiac medications, and we have to tell her the signs and symptoms of uh, the heart failure. Ma'am, you are not audible. Sorry. Ma'am, you have to unmute. I uh, have muted yourself. Sorry. How will you monitor a patient who is on digoxin, and how will you see the toxicity of all the drugs she is taking? Uh, Ma'am, digoxin mainly there will be electrolyte imbalance if the patient is on uh, digoxin and the uh, furosemide. In mainly with the furosemide, the patient will have chances of uh, hypokalemia. So in hypokalemia, there will be ECG changes, and the uh, uh, patient can have un unconscious or uh, Uh, impaired consciousness. So, what uh, do you do to prevent this? You must keep uh, routinely. The routine monitoring of the serum electrolytes uh, ideally has to be done at least every uh, alternate day. The serum potassium levels has to be measured, and uh, we have to ask her to consume the potassium uh, rich diets. Ideally, banana, like banana. And uh, if if the her uh, serum potassium levels are low, we can give potassium uh, sachets. Also, can be given. No? Okay. Syrup or chlor, what that? Or what? What was the role of? Uh, uh, what was she on? What was the diuretic she was on? What is? Uh, no, can was, that be helpful in such patients? Which diuretic was she taking earlier? She was on tap furosemide. No, no. Before, before pregnancy. Before pregnancy. Before pregnancy, she was on uh, tap uh, furosemide and spironolactone. Lactylactone. Lactylactone. Yeah. Lactylactone. So, uh, what? What's the role of? Lactylactone. Concerns with lactylactone. Potassium sparing diuretic. Spironolactone is a potassium sparing uh, diuretic, ma'am. So uh, the chances of patient going into hypo hypokalemia is less when compared to the uh, plain furosemide when you give to the patient. Mm, But since so, it causes so. this uh, anti-androgenic uh, anti-androgenic uh, capacity is bit high with the the side effects are high in the spironolactone. So we ideally stop that during the pregnancy, and we can restart that post then. So, how do you examine a delivered patient with heart disease? How will you examine your patient every day? So, uh, ma'am, routinely we have to uh, see uh, both particular to the uh, postpartum. One is the uh, it. What is this particular patient? Your patient. For our patient, mm. we see the mainly the signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure has to be uh, uh, asked out, and we have to check for the signs and symptoms of that, as we explained about the pulse, BP, so respiration. Be specific. What will you ask, and what will you examine? Ma'am, we have to ask her if she has any symptoms of CHF, uh, uh, breathlessness, dizzy, fatigability. Do you know what is CHF? 
it's you you have to ask the symptoms ma'am we have it? to ask uh, regarding the she is breathlessness on exertion or on rest uh, we'll ask easy fatigability to the patient and then palpitation whether she is able to uh, hear her heart sound or not then on examination we'll auscultate her chest for any crepes for so that we can easily detect the uh, congestive heart failure if the patient is going there. anything else directly on chest anything else we'll ma'am pulse rate JVP saturation is so you have to head to toe examination even in the pure perium right you are not supposed to miss out on anything so what will you check for uh, all the things ma'am starting from the head to toe will uh, pulse rate first of all we'll do the vitals which include pulse rate saturation respiratory rate and bp and after uh, the is temperature uh, of is there any significance of uh, looking for temperature also uh, ma'am or would uh, you like to give it a go when the patient is febrile there are chances of tachycardia which can precipitate okay. heart failure that's why you have to examine her completely no yes ma'am you, you cannot simply pore go just because it's a routine examination so, uh, these first 5 to 6 periods are uh, equally critical as she was in the antenatal period right yes ma'am So what else? Ma'am, head to toe. Uh, mainly, we have to see for the uh, pillow if she is not pale. Um, as she told, first we have to check for vitals, which can be corrected uh, immediately. And other things are supposed to see if she has any paler or cyanosis. Uh, if she has any central cyanosis, mainly if she goes into heart failure. And uh, uh, next is we are supposed to see for uh, JVP, which is uh, which, which might be raised mainly if the patient is in uh, a right heart failure. Next we have to uh, on us. Uh, There will be examination. Hepatomyelitis. Doctor Bandhana, you are not audible. Doctor Bandhana, you are not audible. Uh, Ma'am, we have to palpate for uh, hepatomyelitis to see if there is any uh, right uh, in patients in right heart failure. There are chances that they might go into congestive hepatomyelitis, and we have to look for pedal edema. On auscultation, we can hear basal crepitations if she is mainly in the left heart failure. What else? What else? She has delivered. and other uh, we have to see for the uh, uterine tone assessment has to be done whether the uterus is adequately contracting or not involution and next supposed to check for the uh, bleeding is supposed to ask her also and is supposed to check her uh, uh, bleeding for vagina any is there any pouch discharge you are not commenting on that yes ma'am so That's we have to come yes ma'am confuse you what else Uh, and next, we are supposed to see uh, the perineal uh, hygiene and the care has to be seen, and the episiotomy stitch line has to be checked. If there's any infection, if there's any hematoma, has the chances of hematoma will be high. We have okay. to check that. And we are supposed to ask if she has any calf tenderness, or we have to elicit the signs if there's any redness, uh, unilateral swelling of the uh, limbs, which suggestive of uh, uh, thrombosis. We have to rule out that. Okay, fine. And uh, you've left the baby. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, for the neonatal care in the early neonatal period, we have to ask her to uh, initiate early breastfeeding, which is ideally within one hour of delivery or whenever mother is able to feed, and she has to continue her uh, breastfeeding on demand. Breastfeeding ideally has to be done, and we have to uh, explain her regarding the uh, danger signs in the baby. When the patient baby is uh, uh, when he has any difficult breathing, when he has any gaspings, or uh, if the baby is too hot or too cold, when the change in temperature, the baby is lethargic. Uh, the baby has any change in color, which can be either uh, blue, uh, yellowish, or uh, the blue color, and uh, we have to ask her regarding the cord care. Also, we are supposed to check also if there's any bleeding or if there's any uh, infection discharge from the cord. Fine, perfectly. So, fine. what are the dangers? Uh, yeah, what do uh, you do uh, about contraception initially? You have talked to the patient before delivery, no? She has delivered now. what counseling did uh, you impart her before getting delivered is it important or not yes ma'am ma'am yes ma'am it is important uh, during the antenatal period we have to counsel regarding the contraceptive choices she has well, now she has delivered no what have you decided for her uh, ma'am uh, we can uh, uh, lng uh, intrauterine device Even or just on intrauterine device comes under category MEC category two, so that we can insert the LNG um, IUD for our patient, which comes under MEC criteria uh, category two. She's and how will you counsel? What options will you give to the patient, and what right. pros and cons will you explain to her? How will you uh, other options. Other options. Ma'am, other options include. Uh, progesterone only pills which comes under uh, who uh, category 1 mc category 1 and uh, uh, yeah, copperty 
IUD, which comes under WHO category two, co uh, combined oral contraceptive should be avoided as it increases the chances of thrombosis and increase it will increase the BP and it has an increased. Yes, so, you are giving us the answer. How will you counsel the patient? So, okay. Okay, please carry on. Don't get confused. Carry on. Uh, Ma'am, ideally we categorize the contraceptives according to the uh, MEC category 1, 2, 3 and 4. So in our patient, we can give progesterone on, uh, only pills and implants which is not available in our hospital. So we can either give uh, Mirena insertion can be done which is, uh, we have with, uh, which is category 2. Uh, as she told us, uh, uh, combined oral contraceptive pills are contraindicated. Barriers are quite safe uh, which reduces the PID risk also but it is less reliable because there are high chances of failure. Permanent sterilization option can be given if the patient is allowed or vasectomy can be advised if uh, the husband is willing. What are the danger signs for the mother? You talked about danger signs to the baby. What about danger signs to the mother you had explained? Did you explain danger signs to the mother? Uh, ma'am, uh, yes, ma'am, we explained her. Uh, uh, our patient, uh, she, she's in antenatal period, so she's not delivered yet. So we have to explain. No, 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 post delivery, she's delivered. Post delivery. You have put the forceps, everything has been done. The okay. baby has also dangerous signs. The contraception has also decided. But the mother has no dangerous signs, right? Uh, ma'am, mother dangerous signs include like if she has any uh, episode of breathlessness or palpitation, uh, chest pain, since she had to uh, consult a uh, doctor. Then if the patient uh, has increased bleeding per vaginum or foul smelling discharge or any rise in temperature, then we have to ask the patient these danger signs and she'll inform uh, uh, immediately if she has. Okay, headache. Ma'am, ideally we categorize, uh, we have, we categorize based on the cardiovascular risk and the general obstetrical uh, complications. Uh, so we have to explain her the, uh, we have to rule out the other complications in the postnatal period. As I told the congestive heart failure, arrhythmias and the thrombosis, which are most common in the postnatal period and the obstetrical as such uh, breast tenderness and the breast engorgement has to be ruled out. U UTI, urinary tract infection has to be ruled out. So and, what uh, antibiotics do you uh, prefer in the postpartum period? What antibiotics will you give and for how long and by which route? Practical, practically what you are doing, you tell that. Uh, yes, ma'am, we can take up the questions. Uh, there are five, I think, five questions. Yeah. yeah. So first question is her gravity. So she was a primary gravida. Reason for preterm labor in heart disease patients. These babies are stressed, usually FGR. And any, whenever there is a stress to the baby, you know, so uh, there is always a chance of the mother going into preterm labor. So findings of echo and ultrasound and whole abdomen, usually they are not provided to you in your exams. So if you ask, you can be provided. Uh, why Ventus is not used? So there are pros and cons for both Ventus as well as uh, forceps. So uh, Ventus has less, causes less trauma to the mother. However, chances of trauma to the baby is more and it requires maternal effort also. So therefore, uh, that is the reason why forceps is used. However, so we, we need to know the pros and cons. Uh, next. What will be your choice of antibiotics? If any, peripartum, we've discussed it. Yeah. Why early stuff. ARM? No, avoid early ARM. It's not why early ARM. One should avoid any per vaginal exam. But, uh, we should avoid multiple PVs and uh, early ARM should be avoided to uh, reduce the chances of infective endocarditis. There is another so, question. Findings of eco and ultrasound whole abdomen. So, uh, the PGs can always... answer this. Ah, the PGs mm -hmm. can answer this. Uh, what are the findings of eco and ultrasound the whole abdomen in your patient? This is the question in the chat box. Uh, Ma'am, in our patient eco report, uh, the ejection fraction is 60% and patient has uh, pros uh, mechanical valve replacement so, uh, changes and uh, with mild TR and mild uh, AR along with the Prostatic wall, mechanical wall. 
Um, so, so all the rest of the valves were normal yes. and there were no vegetations, essentially. And no pulmonary artery hypertension and rest the walls are in. So next one is the patient is on oral anticoagulation, came in active labor, how to manage? Uh, Ma'am, if the patient is on oral anticoagulant, then we don't uh, will not give the trial of vaginal delivery as it increases the chances of intracranial hemorrhage. After correcting the INR uh, by giving fresh frozen plasma and uh, vitamin K IV injectables, will uh, if the PTINR is corrected, that is our target is 1.5, we can go for the cesarean section. Yeah, so because we want to prevent the fetal hemorrhage also. That's the reason. Okay, the last, I, this, I think you have already told, explained about the epidural removal and restarting injectable anticoagulants. Have you told about it? Yes, yes this has been discussed. Management okay. of NYHA 3 and 4, this I think. Already done. How will, you, yes. how, will you manage, uh, how will you manage a case of uh, presence of failure? Okay. Mom, basically, it is a multidisciplinary approach. We have to involve cardiologist, anesthesia team, Can ICU team. Do you have a slide? How will you diagnose failure and how would you manage it? Can you go yes. to the next slide? How to manage a patient who will come with heart failure? We will first evaluate the patient and categorize the patient. The evaluation will include uh, evaluation of uh, vitals, which include heart rate, respiratory rate, systemic blood pressure. If the heart rate is more than 130 times per minute and respiratory rate is 25 breath per minute, lactate level is more than two millimole per liter or syst uh, systolic blood pressure is less than 90 mmHg or patient is an altered mental state. She has a cold skin or oligo oligoyuria. We'll, uh, we'll categorize the patient in severe heart failure. And the management of severe heart failure include we have to optimize the preload by using diuretics or fluorosamide or vasodilator if the patient is maintaining systolic blood pressure of more than 110 mmHg. We have to optimize the oxygen requirement either by giving non-invasive ventilation or by invasive ventilation if the saturation falls below 95%. We have to give inotrop support to the patient which include levosimendin. We have to deliver the patient urgently by cesarean section and if the patient is not in, we have to give the mechanical support and if or after mechanical support heart transplant is the option if the patient is stabilized we have to do pre manage preload by using diuretics and control afterload by giving vasodilators uh, arterial dilator like hydralazine and we have to decrease the work of heart by using beta blocker which uh, metaprolol will uh, frequently use so uh, another common complication is AF. So if a patient comes with AF with fast ventricular rate, okay, some most of the AF which we get have a controlled ventricular rate, then we don't need any urgent intervention. But if she has fast ventricular rate, okay, atrial fibrillation, then how do we go about the management? Uh, Ma'am, uh, ideally, uh, the patient depends on the uh, diagnosis. If the patient is rheumatic MS, so mainly the uh, patient will be chronically will be having the atrial fibrillation. So the, the, the uh, no, cardio. No, we are talking about like sudden, sudden AF, and the patient is unstable. What is the? We have two things. One is the rhythm control and when so next we're supposed to do the rate control method. So rhythm control, we mainly control with the IV, uh, IV, uh, ibutalide or the flicanide and the rate control usually with the selective beta blockers or the calcium channel blockers, which mainly includes... No, uh, if the patient is unstable, we will, the patient control. will require electrical conversion. Uh, uh, and we have to but start... But if the patient is okay, then should we require... Yeah. And okay. we have to start on oral anticoagulants to prevent the thrombosis and the risk of embolism. So a uh, patient, how will you detect valve thrombosis in such a patient? And how will you manage if she has one? Ma'am, for uh, symptoms which include dyspnea, sudden onset of dyspnea, or dyspnea or any embolic event which include focal neurological deficit, these are the symptoms a valve thrombosis patient will present. Uh, after symptom, we'll evaluate the patient by doing a transforacic echocardiography or we have to do trans echocardiography 
thrombi and the management will include anticoagulant which includes unfractionated heparin and resorption of the resorption of the oral anticoagulant which patient is uh, taking in patients who are non critically ill in critically ill patients who have obstructed thrombi we can go for the surgical approach and in patient who in which surgic, uh, risk of surgery is high and the when the surgery is not uh, available immediately we have to go for fibrinolysis uh, okay so uh, these were the most common so uh, can you enumerate what are the changes in pregnancy why these uh, women with heart disease are at higher risk of all these complications what are those uh, physiological changes in pregnancy okay we just wind it up with those few questions which you might be asked Uh, so the more, uh, the normal cardiovascular changes which occurs in pregnancy are mainly mom there will be increase in the cardiac output uh, which is in the first trimester by 5 to 10% and in second trimester 35 to 45% which is maximum during the uh, gestation and immediately in the stage 1 there will be increase in more than 30% and stage 2 50 and immediately postpartum more than 80% of the cardiac output will be increased and heart rate uh, there will be increase in the heart rate through the pregnancy ideally there will be more than, uh, 10% by 15 to 18 beats will be increased post early post partum there will be reduction in 5 to 10% blood pressure ideally decreases uh, maybe the uh, diastolic blood pressure will be reduced when compared to systolic blood pressure but when the patient goes in labor uh, during the uterine contractions uh, there is uh, increase in the systolic blood pressure by 15 to 25% uh, and diastolic blood pressure by 10 to 15% and uh, early post partum there will be decrease in the blood pressure and plasma volume uh, the maximum increase in the antenatal time is 40 to 50% which is in the second trimester and in the first and second stage there will be increase in uh, 500 ml of uh, uh, blood will be transfused by each uterine contractions and auto transfusion also increases 500 ml of blood in the early postpartum period mm-hmm. even in third trimester there is increase in uh, blood pressure so yes, early ma'am. third trimester these women are at higher chances after 28 weeks in going into failure okay so uh, can you differentiate uh, whether the physiological changes are they other these changes which are during, during pregnancy they are essentially physiological or pathological can you how do you differentiate that Uh, ma'am, by using uh, various signs and symptoms, for example, if the patient has shortness of breath at rest, then it is pathological. If the patient has chest pain even at rest and it is for uh, larger duration and it it is occur with minimal exertion, she has palpitation at rest and with minimal exertion, she has an syncope. be attack at and she'll uh, fatigue without any at rest or unprovoked fatigueness then it it will, it will lead to what the pathological condition if the heart rate is more than 120 systolic blood pressure is more than 160 or or symptom patient has a symptomatic low bp if the respiratory rate is more than 25 beats uh, breath per minute and the saturation fall down below 95% then it is more toward the pathological condition if the patient has on physical examination if the patient has increased jvp and if the uh, systolic murmur loud systolic murmur or diastolic murmur and if the s4 sound is heard which is not normally heard and the lung on auscultation the wheezes or crackles are present or the patient has pleural effusion then it uh, is toward the pathological signs so we must have a high index of suspicion and when the patient complains we must try and assess uh for any underlying heart disease okay so uh, can we uh, are there any predictors of uh, cardiac events during pregnancy of adverse maternal or fetal outcomes so the predictors are mainly uh, if she has any uh, pre pregnancy uh, if she belongs to nyh class Uh, one or two questions in the question answer box also, which need to. Ah, uh, meanwhile we uh, meanwhile that can be dealt with. The questions in the chat box. Ah, uh, any one of you can take this question. Can you please uh, please explain about the removal and restart removal of epidural catheter? Okay, so and restarting of injectable anticoagulant. So what gap? Ah, uh, you talked about it, but ah, uh, we want you to explain it again. the gap you would like to keep between removal of epidural catheter and restarting the injectable anticoagulant so uh, we have to start the anti- after removal of the epidural catheter we have to start the low molecular weight heparin uh, at least after 6 hours in high risk patients we'll start at a prophylactic dose 
uh, after six four to six hours and therapeutic dose we can start so uh, we need to understand that high risk women uh, okay mm, dr vijayta you are epidural catheter yeah yeah okay so हाँ पर बीच में नहीं सुन रहा था ओके वुड यू लाइक टू डॉक्टर शिवानी ठीक से दोबारा से रिपीट करने के लिए बोले आपको सुन रहा था क्या नहीं नहीं अब टू हेयर व्हाट वाज आह प्रणेतीजी आई थिंक वी कैन टेक दिस क्वेश्चन रोल ऑफ ऑग्मेंटेशन ऑफ लेबर इन आर डिजीज़ इफ दें कैन आंसर सो व्हाट इज � what are the indications of augmentation of labor? So what will be your preference? And when would you like to augment? What will be the indications for augmentation? So, so can you say a few words about it, Dr. Shakun? Uh, augmentation? Uh, look, uh, in current practice, uh, the there is a trend towards natural labor okay so unnecessary or any unnecessary interventions must be awarded they should no, patients should not be augmented or induced un until unless there is very solid indication so only uh, because the patient is not going into labor or uh, the latent phase is slightly prolonged we should not unnecessarily uh, intervene. However, in such cases, like if the patient has had prompt, and we would like to pay, like the patient to deliver timely in order to avoid chances of infection and chances of infective endocarditis. So in that case, in those cases, in such cases, would like to augment. And uh, while augmentation, we'll have to be very careful that uh, we do not cause fluid overload. So, uh, as we are practicing at our institute, it, we should use infusion pumps to give oxytocin in these patients, preferably to avoid yeah. fluid overload. That's, that's the main and, uh, We should avoid early ARM. Early ARM must be avoided and uh, repeated pervagenal examination and during this period. So, we should assess the progress of labor initially by per abdominal examination and we should delay per vaginal examination as far as possible. So in order to optimize labor and unnecessary augmentation of labor must be avoided. Okay, only when there is any very important indication, we should go ahead with it. Okay, so there is another question. Uh, Dr. Harsha, would you like to give any your expert comments? Or yeah. you'd like to add on? No, no, conference with you. Uh, limited and restricted fluid, unnecessary IV fluid should not be given. And uh, yes, of course, as you have said, there's uh, uh, no indication, unless indicated, it should not be augmented. And if at all we need to give syntocinol, it should be given in a concentrated form by infusion pumps. Yeah, new labor care guideline. Don't do anything till six centimeters. <laughs> so oh. there is the last question. Uh, how many pregnancies can a patient go through in NYHA 1, 2, and 3, 4? It's the last question. <laughs> there is no limit to number of, like if the patient's status is one. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> So that uh, at every pregnancy will have to be assessed de novo. It doesn't mean the patients had three pregnancies, but we but uh, as uh, the the condition progresses, she will not remain. Uh, okay, uh, I didn't. I think I did not understand the question. How many pregnancies the patient get through go through in uh, NYT class one? Okay, so. Uh, NYHA class one, it doesn't matter, but as the uh, NYHA class progresses, then you will have to counsel the patient accordingly. The fetal and maternal morbidity and mortality will increase with NYHA. NYHA. 
so uh, that you'll have to counsel accordingly uh, yeah and uh, somebody is in, uh. somebody is in 3 and 4 find out the cause of 3 and 4 and better to treat that first before she undergoes next uh, she has to be oh, explained her limitations basically yeah ideally and maternal life is more important than uh, having pregnancy yeah pregnancy is contraindicated in who4 ma'am they tell yeah. that if the patient conceives is better to terminate rather than continue the pregnancy yes so what are the indications for termination of pregnancy can you list the indication for termination of pregnancy yes ma'am uh, ma'am one is a patient if the patient is in uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension uh, severe uh, systemic ventricular uh, dysfunction where the patient will be in nyh id 3 and 4 and ejection fraction less than 30% previous history of any peripartum cardiomyopathy with residual ventricular uh, dysfunction uh, severe mitral stenosis severe symptomatic aortic stenosis systemic right ventricular uh, wide ventricle with a moderate to severely decreased ventricular function uh, marfan syndrome with aortic root dilatation more than 45 uh, mm or turner syndrome with a uh, bicuspid aortic valve more than uh, uh, 50 mm vascular and dandlons and severe recoagulation so ideally these patients are supposed we have to do medical termination rather than continuing the pregnancy and uh, we must understand that performing mtp in this patient is equally difficult and uh, pro- poses the risk of maternal morbidity and mortality so better would be that they are given good counseling and they should not conceive rather than going in for mtp it is not easy to perform mtp in these women okay so yes, uh, i think uh, should wind up now what do you say dr sir yeah. Oh. Dr. Shakun, uh, I think uh, we should wind up want... now. No, no, they've, like uh, not. No, uh, they've answered most of the questions. Uh, anybody yeah. else? Um, Dr. Harsha, would you like to ask ask yeah, anything else? Yeah, just one remaining question. If at all she right. has to undergo yeah, surgery, yeah. what is the right time? And who should be uh, done the corrective surgery in heart disease, especially the vulvar? Mm-hmm. Ma'am, the surgeries depends on the uh, the ideally is a candidate for ideally we prefer balloon mitral valve to be safe in pregnancy when compared to replacement. So it is to be done between twenty four to twenty eight period of gestation. So if the patient has any uh, congestive heart failure symptoms, if she is severe mitral stenosis. Uh, and uh, in these in, uh, patients we ideally tell them to uh, get correct if she is not corrected pre pregnancy between 24 to 28 weeks we correct so if the patient has any uh, uh, as along with aortic ms along with mitral regurgitation if the patient has any wilkins scoring which is of more than 8 uh, calcified uh, valves so these patients are not the and there is any thrombus also so these patients are not the candidates for valvotomy so these patients ideally we are supposed to do valve replacement Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, so uh, when will you do the valve replacement, ma'am? Uh, ideally, valve replacement is a very uh, dangerous procedure which is to be done in the pregnancy. So if they find out this thing with pre-pregnancy uh, echocardiography, we have to advise her to to be done before pregnancy. But if she continues, we can do between twenty four to twenty eight weeks. It has to be done. Rather, it is preferred to do with delivery. You know. Okay, ma'am. The, uh, tell, because, the guidelines um, says that uh, after twenty six to twenty eight, depending on the viability of the uh, baby, yeah. so you have to perform yeah. a cesarean section, deliver the baby, and simultaneously yeah. you can do the valve replacement. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, that's all. Uh, we can wind up the question answers here. Uh, I think uh, you have you were able to answer most of the questions very nicely. Dr. Harsha, would you like yeah, to? It was present? a very good presentation, and the postgraduates have done a wonderful job. And of course, they have okay. to be more from oh. the practical point of view because yeah, they are yeah. able to answer all the theoretical ones, but they must uh, should they should be able to answer the practical questions also. What they are doing and saying mm-hmm. in everyday practice. Yeah. Uh, overall, it was exactly. a. Presentation. Yeah. So it was a nice uh, and informative class covering all the basics. and uh, uh, the students were able to answer all the questions uh, and on behalf of uh, aogd and the delhi pg forum i would like to thank dr asmita who has uh, given her valuable time for the session today 
and uh, Dr. Shakun and Dr. Harsha have really worked hard with the postgraduates to make this uh, discussion so lucid and interesting. So we are really uh, grateful to you, Dr. Harsha and Dr. Shakun both. And mm -hmm. postgraduates, Dr. Vandana and Dr. Vijeta have also uh, toiled hard as we have seen in the discussion that uh, they were nearly able to answer uh, all the questions. And lastly, my sincere thanks to Jackson Pal Pharma and Dr. Deepika for giving us this lovely platform. And uh, also for our audience and postgraduates from various colleges for patient hearing. And I hope they must have benefited from today's session because- Ah, Ma'am, can you project the slide? Can you project the uh, practical course slide once more? Uh -huh. Ah, Ma'am, please, ma the announcement once more, Ma'am, please. Uh, so uh, this is the practical course and CME uh, held by the Department of Ops and Gyne, MAMC and Loknaik Hospital from 5th to 7th August. Uh, so all the postgraduates, please make it a point to register here because you will be able to thoroughly prepare for your exams. Actually, timing was not mentioned, so the residents were asking about the timings. I think it starts from 9. Uh, that 8 o'clock. First, uh, first uh, usually 8.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. The first, yeah, first class starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and uh, then continues till almost 5.30 to 6 o'clock. Okay. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the first slot is over, no? So that 6,000 till 15 July. Ah, that is over. <laughs> <laughs> or have I you extended the date? Dr. Sunita, that we have extended till 28th. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and our next class, uh, is on abdominal pelvic uh, mass that is on 15th August. So that is with the uh, AIMS. So. Yeah, uh, you can register day. by going to this webinar ID. You can note down the webinar ID and it will be available also in the Facebook live recording. So you can register early so that you get the uh, reminder emails and all. So you can register now for the 15th August class at this webinar ID. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Asmita, Dr. Shakun, Dr. Harsha, Vandana, and Vijay. Thank you, everyone. It was a very good class. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Dr. Sunita. Well Thank you, ma'am. And well and coordinated I... by Dr. Sunita, Dr. Shivani. Thank you, ma'am. I take this opportunity just to project a few of our brands, which are Toxipal DRL, Doxycycline, 100 mg capsules. We have injection maintain, hydroxyprogesterone caproid in 500 mg and 250 mg. And Lycoret Preg Sachet, which is L-arginine, lycopene and DHA for high-risk pregnancies. Lycopene in Lycoret is Lycomato, which is an exclusive... Uh, <coughs> product which comes uh, exclusive marketing rights are only with Jackson Pearl because it is not only plain lycopene but the lycopene in the bioenvironment as it is available in the na nature so that the benefits the health benefits of lycomato are much more so one lycoret capsule would be equal to three lycopene plain capsules so do look for uh, lycoret whenever oxidative stress threatens Thank you all very much, and we look forward to see you again. 15th of August. Yeah, Independence Day. Good night. And before that, the CME at Ramsey. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.